Sugar cane, intracameral phenylephrine, and ACRS recommends now on the use of Omeridia, which is phenylephrine one percent and Ketorolac point three percent. There have been several advisories issued by American Association of Ophthalmology and American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, who advise that those with cataracts should consider the relationship between alpha blocker use and increased risk of cataract surgery complication before initiating the drug therapy. Caution in patients using alpha blockers. They should inform their ophthalmologist prior to intraocular surgery. So it's the responsibility of the urologist to inform the patients who are actually taking alpha blockers. Then they visit the ophthalmologist to inform them. So advise cataract patients who need alpha blocker therapy to consider starting with a non-selective alpha antagonist instead of tamsulosin. The advisory suggests that patients with symptomatic cataracts can undergo cataract surgery prior to starting any alpha blocker treatment. So there is preoperative prophylaxis, employment of necessary measures, and surgical technique modifications. So a multidisciplinary approach between the ophthalmologist, urologist, and other specialities to educate each other about the risk in the respective field. A multidisciplinary collaboration to deepen the awareness of the adverse effect of the drugs and which leads to improvement of the level of provided care. So now several techniques have been developed which will be discussed by the other speakers. There are iris hooks, other malguins rings, other retractors which have will be shown subsequently. Thank you for all your kind attention.
So just put phenokin plus. So phenokin plus can't dilate the pupil which is not dilating because of any reason. Yeah. Yeah. But so it's the only thing that you don't have to. If some patients are allergic to uh, topical drugs uh, dilator, you don't have to use that. Use this. And, and moreover, one more place where I use it is in intimus and cataract. If you try, if you dilate them three hours before in your OPD, many patients, some patients can go in attack. I've seen. So now I stop using preoperatively. Just take them on table and put phenocan plus dilate. So there's no, there are no chances of. And in these Thanks to Dr. Fazili for including me in this course. And uh, as we discussed, that IFAS has, of course, uh, become a menace now, especially as the life expectancy is increasing. So, but there are strategies and there are devices available now which makes our life very easy in cases which we get IFAS. So, I'll just quickly share a few videos with you to make my point clear. First, let's see what what is the what is our protocol nowadays. This is the case. This patient was so. Firstly, it's very important that uh, we take a history from patient. There are four five things questionnaire which are stamped there on on any paper of the patient. And one very important is: Are you taking any medications for prostate or for urinary retention or like that? So that makes point clear and so those patients who are not dilating and are not on those so straight away these patients like this so this is a case which had uh, a black cataract and the pupil which is moderately dilated see if it's this patient doesn't have any history of using tamsulosin we, we won't use any dilated device here because this pupil is almost 5.5 5 millimeter dilated but I know that this patient is on tamsulosin, has moderately dilated pupil, so straight away we use Valgan ring in these cases, which makes our life very easy. And the moreover, this is a black cataract, so straight away we go and put Valgan ring. So once you put this device, we all know it lies in the pupillary plane. We don't, but the beauty is that it maintains the whatever dilatation is there. It doesn't let the pupil come down on you during the surgery. So once you put this and look at the hardness of the cataract, it's total black cataract. So I use drill and chop technique. Pupil is very well maintained. And you finish off surgery, put IOL, enlarge the axis to appropriate size. This is another beauty of this device that you can actually size your capsule axis well and take off this device and see once I take off this device pupil again comes down and once I start doing irrigation aspiration of the residual ovid the pupil start the iris starts coming in the side view. So had I not used this device in the beginning believe me it's, it's uh, look at the billowiness of the uh, iris when I'm putting this hydro stitching the incisions. So this is the standard protocol now, patient is on tamsulosin, moderately dilated pupil or uh, so straight away we go ahead and use this pupil dilated device rather than struggling during the case. So
I'll show two, three videos here. Now have a look at this as we were discussing that the intraoperative maneuvers are very important. That so this is the case. Uh, patient was not on tamsulosin, but many case, cases they also have floppy iris because of many other reasons, other drugs which they have been using. Uh, we really don't know what all drugs they are using. But thing which I want to show here is look at this. Now the, again, iris starts coming out. So at this point, so what you don't have to do is. You don't have to go and straight away push OVD here because there is a lot of fluid which is trapped inside. So I go ahead and burp the incision, put pressure on the posterior lip of the incision so that the excess fluid comes out. And once you have the excess fluid coming out, then you go ahead and put some OVD there. The same thing from the side port, go ahead and put little OVD. So you need to be very slow and I just hydrate the wall of the incision so that we have tight incision there, incisions are not leaky. Then I go ahead and finish this case. So this is this is just a mild floppiness of the iris which doesn't cause much of the intraoperative problem but you need to be careful with your maneuvers that they are very gentle. Another case. As Dr. Snowball said that rexis, till this time, I'm making rexis, pupil is well dilated, sorry. And the moment I do hydrodissection, pupil uh, starts coming down. And this is a softer cataract, I make a trench here. And again, there is mild floppiness of the iris, as you can note here. It starts coming towards the side port. So if there is just mild floppiness, you can, you don't have to come out again and again and try to push the iris. Just let it be there. It's a mild floppiness. Little bit of iris tissue is there, but you can safely complete your FACO. And then just go ahead and put some OVD. It will comes down, but so always do bimanual IA in these cases because the main port is bigger. If you try to go through main port, the iris will tend to prolapse. So just go through side ports, do bimanual IA and exchange hands. Try not to touch the under surface of the iris. Once you uh, touch that, pupil will become Smaller. So this way you finish the case. Take off so This is the mild floppiness of the iris, which you can easily manage if you are very gentle in your maneuver and hydro stitch all the incisions. So last case, another case had was on tamsulosin and the pupil is again non-dilating. Non so as I said, our protocol is straight away go ahead and put the uh, maligan ring here. So I go ahead and put maligan ring. So once you put this ring, you get perfect uh, dilatation of the pupil. You can safely take out the nucleus and look at the Billowing of the iris, which keeps happening. So here it scores over any other ring, malignant ring that it's sturdy. It maintains the pupillary uh, dilatation very well. And go ahead and put OVD and large axis to desired size. And be careful while taking out the all the scrolls from the pupillary margin. And once you take it out. I will look at the propensity of the iris to come toward the incision. I am just showing that. So I think uh, with the pupillary expanded devices, all iris soaps or any other device which you are comfortable with, if you do use these devices right from beginning, it makes your uh, life very easy and case very simple and safer for you.
Thank you very much. Yes. How many times are you, by your expertise and your ego, stopped from using pupil uh, uh, expanding device right there at the start? No. Uh, see, the thing is, uh, I, what I believe is that if patient is on tamsulosin, I don't have to struggle in between. No. Because once you put this device, it, it makes surgery very simple, and patient understand that. Why not to use a device which is so simple, which is safer, which gives better result rather than struggling with the RS tissue, you have atrophic patches here and there, you know. So that's, that's my uh, thinking is. So the carry home message To use any expanded device, my preferred device is this, but if patient has history of tensilocin, patient is not dilating, you have to use expanded device and you have to dilate the pupil. So, bottle height, truly speaking, uh, if there is uh, severe floppy iris, then only I bring it down. Usually, it remains at 80 or bottle height. So, I bring it down to even I work on 40 to 50 also. So, but that doesn't help much, I've seen. That doesn't help much. So, I think let's see what Dr. Fazili has to show. He has some amazing uh, cases and videos. That is really hot in Kolkata. <laughs> no, the door is open. I've just sent it to the... No, the AC is not working. I'm even watching. Ah, but it's actually because the AC is not working. So after those amazing videos by uh, Dr. Harshal, I'm going to show you less amazing ideas and less amazing trials. Yeah, we're talking about operative floppy iris syndrome, and I'm suggesting from Srinagar. No financial. So we know that uh, beyond uh, preoperative prophylaxis for patients associated with high risk to developing IFIS, um, there are protocols that should ensure that the hazards in hazard is highlighted before the surgery, and necessary measures and surgical technique modifications are employed, like Dr. Harshal showed us. Primarily, these patients should also be assigned to the most senior member of the surgical team. But I guess that's also a hurdle to other people learning. The modern day of, uh, modern t the way of learning is that you know, get prepared for a certain problem and then go ahead with that. So we know iris billowing, floppiness, iris prolapse to the incisions and progressive intraoperative meiosis are the problems here. So you can see 
as uh, uh, the fluid current goes inside, even before we are doing anything, let's say we are putting uh, phenocane or we are putting in uh, trap and blue or we are washing it off, if the plane of these fluids is above the iris, nothing will happen. But when the fluid current touches the posterior iris, you will see the billowing, iris blowing and the floppiness. But if it's above it, then you will not see it. But if it's below it, when it's touching the posterior surface of the iris, then there will be billowing and then there will be things. Look at this. A, uh, a surgery, well dilated pupil, you can see with a little bit of hydration just because the fluid is going underneath also. So we are seeing some amount of billowing. And when the fluid pools behind the iris, surely the iris will billow. And this iris, because it's thinner, it, is, it has a propensity to come out from the ports and leading to a floppy iris prolapsing. So the same case, we see we've used uh, topical atropine here. You can see the billowing very clearly. And uh, some people also use epinephrine. We know that epinephrine by now, we know that it doesn't help much, but 1% unpreserved lidocaine for IFS might help a little bit. But as soon as uh, the, I, uh, I personally do not use it, I generally speaking use it for all cases as such. We do not dilate preoperatively. The viscoelastic has to have the same, same principle, that you don't have to go under the iris. Same thing about fluids and same thing about viscoelastics. And while you are doing the capsulorexis, you can see in this case the size of the pupil is quite okay. So we are doing a capsulorexis. And uh, the idea is not to touch this iris. These irises are more sensitive, rather hypersensitive to touch. The moment there is a fluctuation in the anterior chamber or you touch the iris, it will come down. Here we are seeing you can see how much this iris is blowing because I'm like we knew that this is going, hydro procedures are very important and at the time of hydro procedures there's a possibility of the iris coming out. You can see at the incision, I'm doing a very gentle hydro procedure, yet the iris has a tendency to come out. So I'm putting viscoelastic in a certain plane and then going ahead. The pupil size has actually come down, but we can see that FACO is still very comfortably possible. And it's also important to keep this floppy iris away from the phaco tip. Sometimes if um, unintentionally the uh, occlusion breaks, this iris can actually just come in and into then cause a sphincter damage. You can see as soon as I've come in, I've come out, I've come out with irrigation, continuous irrigation on, and you could see the iris had come out. And when the pupil size becomes smaller, it's very important for you to have a good vision. And uh, I found this uh, an excellent maneuver to use the Y hook and uh, look and then operate. I blindly, I would not want you to operate at all. You can see again the iris has a propensity to come out. The viscoelastic, especially a higher density viscoelastic, into the anterior chamber at the right plane usually restores the iris back into the anterior chamber. Then you go ahead in implant a lens and uh, that should uh, take care of things. Another important step at which you might uh, see uh, uh, the iris coming out is at the time of the stromal hydration. Yeah, if you are putting too much fluid into the anterior chamber, hyperinflating it, the iris will again have a propensity to come out. It will have a tendency to come out. So the hydro procedures, the um, stromal hydration also has to be very, very gentle and only just adequate. You can see here, what I've done is I've done just a mild, um, a small amount of hydro procedures, and uh, that prevents the iris from coming out when I'm actually cleaning up the viscoelastic. And at the end of uh, removal of this viscoelastic, you can see this is a floppy iris. You can see the billowing now. Uh, and uh, as the fluid currents move, you can see but if you stop the irrigation before you come out, the tendency to uh, have an eye, you can see I've stopped irrigation and come out gently, and not to press the lower lip, and then the possibility of iris coming out at this stage might be much lesser, and we complete the stromal hydration. 
So a gentle and minimal hydro, hydro procedure, like I told you, is very important. As you go in, you, the fluid wave comes in and it goes out from the other side. If it comes out, if you, you're push, pushing too much fluid inside, what happens is that the fluid comes out and touches the posterior surface of the iris. And that's where the floppiness starts. And you can see right at the hydro procedures that there is uh, iris prolapsing. You can see here, I'm trying to do a hydro procedure. Uh, the rexus is already done, and you can see the iris is uh, uh, trying to come out. Uh, uh, like Dr. Harshul demonstrated very nicely, it's better to uh, deflate the anterior chamber a little bit. I'm doing that now. I was not doing it earlier. And now I have a plane, and I'm putting in viscoelastic, and the iris is pushed back. It's always good to use a uh, higher density viscoelastic whenever you want to. But uh, you can see this is another case uh, where um, the pupil size is not that great. But um, um, I think I can go ahead and uh, operate this. You can see even the air bubble is running through and going back. Use of intracameral um, epinephrine or other things, I don't think that increases the size much. You can see I have been able to um, complete this case, turn off the irrigation to reduce the intraocular pressure before removing the phaco tip. And same goes for the IA. When you come out, you stop the irrigation and then you come out. That doesn't mean that it might not happen. It can still happen, but uh, the possibility is less. You can see this is an anterior placed incision. Anterior placed incision, this is 2.2. So I've actually gone ahead. The idea here is that you might have a little difficulty. There may be a little overlocking here and there. But an incision like this will, you are actually in an area where the iris will have less tendency to. So that, that's very important regarding the incision. And you can see the side ports also are slightly longish. Longish and, if possible, a little anterior. Again, uh, when we start off doing phaco emulsification, that time these uh, type of incisions might be a little difficult, but with a little bit of experience, uh, we usually get over with that difficulty. Because the problem with uh, longer side ports and longer incisions, you can see the billowing is here. The, the iris is moving as the fluid currents are passing. You can so, so surely I know this is. So this is where I should have gone ahead and implanted a pupil expanding device. But I continue to do what I'm doing, and I think my pupillary size is good enough. That sign was so critical. That amount of billowing was so important. I should have intervened at that time. But we can see now that everything seems to be going on fine. You can see I have now uh, removed the viscoelastic um, and uh, deflated a little bit, done a hydro procedure. Not much. Now we can see, yeah, there's a tendency for the iris to come out. And this is a, uh, almost a severe um, uh, iphis. It's severe iphis. So now I, I'm still going on. Right now I should have played it safe. But I'm not playing it safe, and look what happened. Look what happened. You, we, we can watch this again a little bit. See, I'm here. I'm trying to chop. I'm going near the pupillary margin. That's what happens. That's what happens. That's what I did not um, um, decide right at the center that I should be using a pupil expanding device and make it a safer thing. Now that the damage is done, and I still need to change my strategy because uh, recognition of a problem and admitting a mistake and moving on and making um, corrective measures. So iris retractors are being put. Now what these iris retractors do, they provide sufficient tension to the iris stroma. Iris retractors um, uh, should ideally have been put right at the start when I was doing because the rexis is made here. I have to be careful that it does not come into the uh, capsular excess margin. Once the hooks are there and the pupil is stable, they have, have uh, sufficient tension to the iris stroma. Now I can go ahead and finish the case in a comfortable way. You see, this is another thing we have to look at. The pupil is big, no main port, but from the side port, you know, so the iris is coming again and again. And uh, I am uh, trying to visco-reposit it again. 
that's not the best way always because that much of um, uh, prolapse needs of, uh, going through to another port and putting it inside. So uh, revisiting the port constru construction, uh, perhaps like I told you before, uh, uh, we should be making these ports slightly, slightly different. And uh, the incisions uh, when IFIS is expected, slightly longish, slightly longish uh, side port incisions also, apart from using um, pupil expanding devices, yeah, these are good steps and they help in uh, avoiding the IFIS. Now this is again another case of severe IFIS. You can see I've fashioned the incisions quite anteriorly. So things look quite all right. The pupil size looks very, very manageable. So go, I go in and uh, viscodilate and I can see nothing is happening right now and things seem to be moving quite okay. There was not much billowing also. But uh, as soon as I complete the rexis, I can see uh, my pupil size is going down. Now, till there, everything is fine. I told you the step, important step is the hydro. As soon as I'm doing hydro, you can see now the iris is coming out. Also, the pupil size is going down. I'm, I'm uh, dialing the nucleus, and you can see now this pupil size is not good again. Um, because I think um, I might be able to manage this. Again, a mistake. This is surgery done quite a long time back. That time we did not understand this um, that well, but you can see the iris is quite floppy now. Now we don't have a choice. I told you that surgery means constant uh, planning and uh, dynamic uh, decision making. So. Um, one option would be that you always, whenever you see billowing, whenever you have a patient who has a history of tamsulosin intake, you go ahead and put the uh, rings right at the start and make the surgery safe. But if you've not been able to do that, there's always time and uh, there's always uh, the right time to uh, put in new uh, steps so that you are able to handle it. I'll skip the surgery. This is another uh, case of severe IFIS. Now, there might be certain problems that might occur uh, with the struggles at the main port. You can see the iris has come out here. So I'm trying to reposit it. I'm trying to reposit it. Uh, I've gone through the side port, and I'm trying to bring this iris back. Uh, this would, you know, iris has memory. So this, uh, generally speaking, this would be the best way of doing it. But we also showed you in our earlier surgeries that viscoelastic is quite good enough if your chamber is not deep. See, I'm going again. I'm going, uh, trying to go in. The iris is trying to come out. I'm going in, and you can see the iris coming in front of me also. But I realized that this repeated uh, effort to go in and come out has caused a desmix detachment. So uh, this is one of the problems which can be associated with troublesome uh, incisions from where the iris is coming out. So I leave this incision as it, leave the desmix detachment you can see, and make another incision and complete the surgery from another incision. And the pupil will always be unreliable, we know that. So um, I will skip this surgery. Uh, important thing uh, which Dr. Herschel pointed out is the better option would be to use uh, the bimanual. But with uh, small pupils which we encounter with IFIS, uh, I think uh, more surgical uh, skill is needed and let the best man operate. And uh, iris retractors, although uh, time consuming, may consume a little time, are sometimes preferred by cataract surgeons over pupil expanders due to their significantly lower cost and better safety profile in cases with the shallow anterior chamber. When applied, one of the retractors should be located directly beneath the main incision, forming a diamond-shaped uh, pupil, thus pulling the iris away from the phaco tip and decreasing the risk of iatrogenic trauma. In this case, um, you can see a clear corneal incision behind which we are placing another report from where the iris hooks will be placed. I'll just uh, move this. You can see? Good good amount of exposure. The iris is uh, very comfortably and in control. And on the other hand, pupil expansion devices uh, are uh, um, 
most common cases much easier to use, require less operating time as Dr. Soin will show us, do not require extra incisions, and provide a stable pupil during the surgery, minimizing the post-operative pupil deformity and the anterior chamber inflammation. So in the end, we're talking about um, uh, a careful incision location and construction, use of less aggressive, low flow, phaco emulsification, fluidic uh, parameters. Uh, they are able to effectively control iris behavior and lead to much lesser cases of IFS. A gentle hydro dissection is very important. Minimum, minimum in and out movement and keeping the iris flow above the iris plane should be helpful. I thank you all for your kind attention. Dr. Swin, come on, tell us are your words. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Sajjad, for this opportunity. Uh, do we have a HDMI? Do you want to use USB 3? Me, Jaya. As mild undulation of the iris, which is probably where you'll get away with it, and uh, no big problems. It's a very old video, and then you have a grade two where where I mean, it's a little bit worse than that. The people keeps coming down. Uh, sorry for the video quality. It's a very old. It's taken from a VHS, and you see every time you inflate the anterior chamber, the pupil becomes wide, and again it becomes small. And as we go to the severe iris, this is one case where I have already put iris hooks, but I could barely finish the uh, capsular excess and my pupil iris was already frayed and looked like a fishing net and uh, well this is the procedure was difficult but we managed to put in the uh, lens in the back uh, a useful tip is always to use your side port instrument to protect the iris once you have contacted it now intraoperative myosis is the biggest issue so once the pupil comes down after a capsular excess it's always a challenge so what we need to do is use a device which helps uh, BHEX is very useful uh, since uh, it you allows you a direct visualization of the capsular excess margin as you negotiate past the uh, capsular excess. So it'll inject a little bit of viscoelastic under the pupil margin and over the capsular rim. <coughs> and you tuck that flange, as you tuck that flange under the pupil margin, you take it more peripherally and you can, under direct visualization, you see that you've not engaged the capsular excess margin. No, no pupil expander allows you that benefit mm -hmm. where you can mm -hmm. see and if control in a controlled manner you tuck it. So if you see that you've engaged it, you can always go back and again do that retucking. And once you've done that, you're back to your comfort zone and now you can see that capsular excess margin so well. Same thing over here, the, uh, Dr. Deepak's, Deepak Mago's video. Uh, same thing, again the pupil comes down and now it's time to inject a little bit of visco under the pupil margin. Once you see that, now it's time to take a call and inject that viscoelastic and tuck that BHEX flange under the pupil margin. And as you negotiate it, you see that you have instant confirmation that you have cleared the excess margin without engaging it. <laughs> now, can we make a pre-op uh, diagnosis as to whether the case would be a IFIS or not? Well, no, certainly not. For a pupil seven millimeter or smaller, the risk of IFIS existed regardless of alpha blocker intake. And in Indians, the incidence is much higher. And in fact, hypertension is another cause of IFIS. This is a long list of uh, drugs uh, and conditions which can cause IFIS. So no amount of history taking can really be helpful. And the complications are really can be disastrous. So IFIS has got floppy iris, meiosis, and iris prolapse. It's the meiosis, in the, the meiosis part that is taken care of by iris hooks or pupil expander. What they do is they provide a constant pupil size, uh, allowing con good visibility and safe phaco emulsification. 
As far as the iris prolapse is concerned, it's actually no device can help you. It depends on the severity of the IFS and the pathological damage to the stroma and muscles. So on a day when you get away in an IFS, it's, there's no credit to the device. It's just lower grade IFS. So you can feel happy about it, but the device will not work for the next time. Fortunately, surgeons have reduced their threshold because of the unpredictability of IFS, the exacting mm -hmm. patient expectations, and unforgiving nature of premium IOL technology. So choice of pupil ex expander in intraoperative myosis, both IF, uh, iris hooks and uh, BX would probably be very helpful because it can negotiate past the capsulosis margin without engaging it. So an ideal device in IFS would be something which uh, requires small incision, has a low vertical profile, and can exit through the side port. Iris hooks and BX both uh, fit the bill. Now, as far as BX is concerned, it can be inserted uh, through a 1.2 millimeter incision as well. Uh, so that's uh, 1.2. Only thing is, if you have the uh, flange across the incision, it'll be difficult. When you hold it in the middle, it'll be difficult to get it in, and the flange might get uh, distorted. Instead, if you hold the flange at the end and align it to the incision, it goes in pretty smoothly. So it ca you can use a 1.2. No device in the history of ophthalmology has been able to do that. 1.2 millimeters. Now, you could remove a BHEX through a 0.9 millimeter incision, a side port incision. All that you need to do is, uh, it's thin, as thin as a human hair, so you can just use that forceps, grab that flange, draw it centrally, disengage those two notches on either side, and just draw out the device, and it walks out <coughs> of a side port incision. Again, no device can really do that. So in a tight situation where iris is prolapsing, you can, you, this would be a blessing. So lessons that we learn is that there are a host of systemic conditions that can cause IFS. IFIS can occur in pre-op people seven millimeters or smaller. It's important to realize that women also are often on TAPS, TAPS alone for UTI. And so iris hooks, our pupil expander, do not eliminate the risk of iris prolapse. They may reduce the incentives of fluttering, and they do maintain a dilated pupil, which provides uh, visibility for safe PACO. So every eye is IFIS can candidate. Uh, reduce your threshold for using pupil devices and keep stock. Uh, this I would uh, encourage you to uh, look up this uh, article, uh, which is quite informative. Thank you very much, Dr. Sajjad, for this opportunity. I think I'm on time. Yeah. <laughs> Kuresh can't complain. <laughs> He's here for the next session. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank it you. was a pleasure being here.